Hello everyone, thank you for joining this session. Uh, we are going to begin. Um, please turn off your cameras in order to begin with the event. Thank you very much. Uh, Luis, please turn off your camera, Leah, and Andres, please turn off it. Uh, well, today we are going to begin and our uh, presentation will be uh, Rodolfo. Please, hello, Rodolfo. Your floor is your. The floor is your. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Rudolf. Welcome to the 13th M4DT day with the topic blockchain. My name is Rudolf Souza. I currently work at the National Institute of Metrology Quality and Technolo Technology of Brazil uh, in Metro as a division chief. Today, I will be the host for this event. Before to, uh, to the start, it's important for you to know some specific guidelines. First of all, the event will be records uh, from the beginning until the end. Please, your, uh, your microphones and camera must be turned off unless you are asked specifically otherwise. Uh, you can use the chat to ask any question to the speaker at any time, but they will answer it as soon as the speaker ends the presentation. Right after the end of the event, a short survey about the today's experience will appear. Please, it will take a little time, but for us is important feedback to improve our work and next events. The workshop is organized by Metrology Working Group 14, of the Inter-American Metrology System. Sorry. Okay. The workshop is... Uh, I will continue to speak and then uh, uh, we start in a few minutes the, the, the talk. The workshop is organized by Metrology Working Group 14 of Inter-American Metrology System. And our objective with this event is to promote the digital transformation in the region and make liaison with similar organizations. The, Metrology Working Group is the link between the SIN uh, Metrology Working Groups and the digital transformation. The Metrology Working Group 14 has six task force to specifically work with subjects that interest the region. I invite to participate in all of them. The contact of the groups will shortly be, show, be shown in the chart box. We starting now. Uh, uh, 
The, this workshop is organized by the Cloud Metrology Working Group, that the one that I, I'm a coordinator, and we we discuss the the, the subject of uh, um, cloud systems. Uh, what can we do? And uh, blockchain is a kind of a cloud system. It don't work locally, but works throughout the the internet. And uh, it could be very useful in metrology for metrology uh, tasks. And we are discussing some of them with uh, Jean Martina from Federal University of uh, Santa Catarina, Brazil, uh, Mabuba Moni from PTB, Daniel Peters from PTB and Wilson Mello from uh, Inmetro. He's a colleague of me in Inmetro. And Alex Valky will present who, uh, the 10th edition of the magazine De Acuerdo, Science at, our, at Your Measurement. We will be starting with the first presentation of the day, and this is Merging Brazil Digital Metrological Artifacts with Blockchain Presentation with Blockchain. The presenter will be John Martina from the University Universidad Federal of Santa Catarina, Brazil. Sí, Diego, muchísimas gracias. Aquí tenemos algunas preguntas para Diego y para Jimmy. Bueno, empezamos con Jimmy. Jean is a senior lecturer and researcher at La, uh, 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 LabSec Security Laboratory of the university. He's current, currently working on authentication protocols for telemedicine environments, on the formalization of security ceremonies, the designs of IoT tailored security protocols, and blockchain application. Jean is also a visiting lecturer, lecturer in computer science at the University of Hartford Ford Shire, working mainly at project supervisors for uh, BSc and MSc degrees. Welcome, Jean Martina. Please go, go ahead with your presentation. Okay, Rodolfo, thank you very much for the introduction. I'll just uh, put my, my slides in presenta full presentation mode. I'll be looking to my side because I have another screen so I can keep an eye on the chat as well as do my presentation. So let me just get uh, that. So I hope you can you can see my screen now. Is it? Yes, can we you can. Okay, great then. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, you all for the invitation. Okay, it was uh, a pleasure. Uh, we've been working with different uh, uh, projects. Uh, uh, till today, uh, some involving in Metro, that is our uh, metrology institute here in Brazil. And, and what I'm trying to bring you here is how to connect the project that in Metro has today with blockchain in the near future. Okay, and and we have everything set in these uh, in these things, and and it will be uh, uh, probably a very important thing to be doing in the future this uh, merging between the metrological devices and the, the artifacts that they generate and use blockchain to track that. So to give you some context, okay, uh, Inmetro has a project that is being run here with, with LabSec at, at Federal University of Santa Catarina uh, that's called uh, uh, Medida Inteligente. It, it is for uh, uh, an intelligent measurement system for fuel pumps in, in Brazil, okay? Brazil has an endemic problem of, uh, of gas stations uh, messing up with uh, the metrological devices and, and having, uh, and we end up having problems on, on when you go anywhere to fill up your car, okay? Uh, because uh, th these devices, even though they are certified, they are tempered with uh, uh, by the users and, and do the sheer size of the country and the way how the metrological uh, certification process work, sometimes it's very difficult to catch every single fraud, 
and and there uh, um, there are some uh, uh, research here in Brazil today that that tells us that we we have like a, a, a probably 50% of the gas stations in Brazil have some issue uh, when dealing with this uh, sort of, uh, of metrological devices and frauds end up happening. So what happened is that Inmetro has uh, now a, a digital certification for metrology project, that is uh, this one. It ends up being developed uh, as an app that will be uh, in the hands of, of the citizen uh, of trying to, to fuel their cars. Uh, Inmetro for that uh, is, is using a strategy based on the Brazilian search, uh, uh, PKI, Okay, so Inmetro became uh, 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 a certification authority within the Brazilian PKI in uh, 2022. Uh, and, and what happens is that uh, uh, in Metro, with the, the local players in, in this market, they're developing a, a metrological system that will create a, a digital artifact that is digitally signed for every measurement that is taken. OK, and that that's being uh, actually delivered to the user uh, in, in this app and the user can check if the information is correct from that uh, uh, tamper proof and verified device. And if they don't uh, if they don't see that correct, they can report problems. OK, so it is a security and inspection infrastructure that was built that, that is, is already a reality. OK, we have already a few pumps. Uh, working with that, we have this app uh, starting uh, to be used. Then comes uh, comes the question: Is there an opportunity on having in Metro going uh, started starting producing these digital artifacts for measurements? And and what we realize is that every every metrological device will be able in the future to generate these digitally signed receipts of the measurement, and and this is. Uh, quite interesting because if we use these uh, 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 receipts, we can track use, okay, and also track variations in calibration in certain conditions. And what we realize is is that uh, if we collect uh, uh, most of the measures or almost all the measures, we can start deriving uh, some byproducts that are not exactly what. The, the, the metrological artifact, the digitally signed metrological artifact was designed to, to provide, but we can start creating derivation. So in this case of fuel pumps, uh, we are targeting having a metrological control on, on the volume that is being released by the pump. But if we are able to collect all these measurements and, and with some little information, we can actually check how good or bad is the actual car efficiency certification program that in Metro also runs. So uh, uh, what we what we seen so far is that there is an opportunity when we have uh, these uh, uh, metrological digital artifacts widespread. But then come some questions. How do we collect them all? How do we organize them all? And how do we process them all? OK, so uh, one of the suggestions that we have been introducing is the use of blockchains. In a more specific sense, uh, we we are uh, uh, we are thinking in using hyperledger fabric, okay, because it it has a, a more business oriented uh, uh, notion and and strategy, uh, and also because it, it's it can be targeted better for this sort of application. So for those who do not uh, uh, know very well blockchain, uh, the idea is that we have a ledger where everything that is happening is being recorded in there. Uh, we use this transaction list to keep history. Okay, so we know uh, what happened in, and when it happened and who made the change. And it, it is basically a, a, a hash pointer strategy. So every block points to the next. And, and has the integrity of, of, of that block, okay? And talking about uh, uh, Hyperledger Fabric in itself, it has some, uh, some efficiency tweaks, like uh, uh, what we call word state, that is a database that tells you the, last, the latest state of a certain variable or a certain asset that you're tracking within the blockchain. And it is designed also to work in, in, in a private and permission way. So we need to authorize 
people who be joining the network and people uh, who be actually using the data on, on the network. Uh, if you need more information, we have like the documentation for Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, but the idea here is that the transactions are part of block data. These blocks, block data are interconnected between themselves. Okay. And then we have a hash chain to, to guarantee uh, integrity of the whole data that is being put in there. Also, the organization of Hyperledger Fabric is slightly different than what one would know know when when using standard blockchains okay uh because most of the blockchains they focus on on financial transactions and then they come with uh, uh, an assumption that makes sense in, in that scenario that is the use of of pseudo uh, of pseudo identities uh and basically we have that concept of wallets and that you don't have to identify yourself and so on and in, in certain scenarios it, like metrology and legal metrology in, in this specific case, it is very, very important that all the peers are identified, all the transactions are digitally signed, and that we know for sure who did uh, what, okay? So uh, in this sense, I think what's important to explain to you here is that the organization of the network is slightly different, okay? We, we have the concept of, uh, of organizations, okay? So an organization, is someone that would like to join the network. Uh, an organization may play very different roles, okay? We have uh, also the, the concept that uh, uh, Hyperledger Fabric allows us to have multiple ledgers. We do not have to have one single ledger. We can also have multiple consortiums, okay? So you may participate uh, in the network with different peers, with different views of the information. But the most important thing in here is that we do not act into this, uh, into this network or we do not interact with this blockchain infrastructure uh, with anonymity. We actually do that being identified. And the strategy behind uh, identification in Hyperledger Fabric, it comes from uh, using uh, uh, digital certificates. That uh, attaches very well with the strategy that Inmetro is already using to create identities for each one of the metrological devices that are being put in, in at first in this fuel pump scenario. Okay, so what's important in here is that Hyperledger Fabric changes the strategy on identity management that is used in, in blockchains, okay? And this, in, in, in here, uh, identities are, are uh, entities are identified solely using X509 certificates or, or 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 some sort of alias to that whenever you want to provide them some pseudo anonymity. Okay, so it's mostly by using certificates. These certificates are issued by certification authorities that can be organizationally owned or in, in like the case that we are about to propose for you here, using like a countrywide certification uh, um, authority scheme. Okay, uh, certain different uh, different fields in the digital certificates will identify the type of uh, of entity. If it is an entity that can uh, hold a copy of the ledger, or if it is an entity that can run an application, can call a contract, and so on. And what we've seen is that using this sort of, of hyperledger fabric it's very very interesting when we're when we are doing government uh, subside or government oriented solutions uh, especially because it do, it does not assume pseudonymity by default so we do not have to cope with problems that pseud that pseudonymity brings us like having to uh, like a, a consensus strategy that would be wasteful in resources, okay? Like proof of work or proof of stake. And, and in this sense, uh, we've seen that Hyperledger Fabric is, is very, very interesting. Uh, also, it, it is reasonably easy to configure, to configure uh, Hyperledger Fabric to accept uh, certificates from different sources and from different uh, origins. So we, it, it's basically the whole access infrastructure in whichever entity in the in the Hyperledger network uh, works like that, you have like a, a membership service provider, and in there you have uh, the certificates that you trust, either for identity or for connection. And basically, 
what you need to do is to put the right information in the right folder and then you can put a hyperledger fabric to run under certain digital certificate conditions okay um, so uh, what we have in here is that there are some special fields that needs to be used whenever you want to issue a digital certificate uh, to enable that identity to run in 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 the blockchain okay so if you if you are doing that with hyperledger fabric uh, either you use this uh, object id that is 1.2.3.4.5 that's there is a very odd story on why do they use this number this is not a a, a yana assigned number okay it's sort of a joke how it ended up in the code uh, but uh, then you can also identify uh, the entities by organizational unit or common name or these attributes and then you can tell if the person can do things in, in as an admin as a client as an order or as a sim simple peer for running an application okay so it, it is very important to tell that because the only change that in metro would have to do to make all fuel pumps being able to cast their registries to a blockchain would actually be adding one of these elements into the digital certificates that are being issued okay so if the fuel pumps uh, that already are being certified and and and, and having uh, uh icp brazil that is the brazilian government pki digital certificates issues to issue to them if they bring some of these uh, uh, uh identifications here like the uh, uh, using specific OU or uh, or object IDs, then that fuel pump, every single metrological uh, uh, artifact that is generated by the metrological device uh, would be blockchain uh, uh, process. You'd be able to process it in a blockchain. So it is a very, very tiny modification on what's already going on. Uh, so uh, what, what happens is that... Uh, there, there is a, another uh, uh, caveat whenever we are talking about integrating these digital certificates from the Brazilian PKI to, to Hyperledger, okay? Because uh, most of the blockchains around the world and, and most of the implementations, they use um, NIST-based cryptography, okay? So basically, you'll be using uh, uh, elliptic curves, ECDSA, that is elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, and they will be using uh, uh, curves that are based on NIST specification. And, and what happens is that in 2012, Brazil banned uh, within the federal government the use of these, uh, uh, of these elliptic curves, okay, because of Snowden's revelation on how maybe some of the elements of uh, on the choices made to create these curves were tweaked by uh, NSA and that may pose a risk. And what happened is that Brazil never used that. Actually, Brazil uh, uh, uses ECDSA with BrainPool, that is a German uh, 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 curve system, okay, for ECDSA, but we have that ban. So it is very difficult for Brazil to go straight using the digital certificates, just augmenting that, um, uh, uh, that digital certificate with those elements that I just shown. But what happens is that Brazil uh, now uses uh, a new uh, uh, digital signature scheme for elliptic curves that use what we call Edward, Edwards uh, uh, curves. And more, most specifically, Brazil uses ED25519 and ED448. And actually in Metro, when creating their infrastructure within the Brazilian PKI, opted for these Edwards algorithms they, they are very good and very efficient they are so efficient that they are now part of the tls standard tls 1.3 already uh uses that so uh what happened is that here we started developing uh hyperledger in itself the standard code base do not support these digital certificates to make that possible uh we here uh, in, in in labsec we produced uh, a pull request Okay, we, we made some code changes and we submitted last August to, to Hyperledger. And basically what we are doing, okay, because 
our certification authorities cannot use ECDSA or, uh, of course, an RSA doesn't make sense on a blockchain due to its size. Uh, we produce uh, Edwards curve support for Hyperledger Fabric, and then we brought that as a pull request, and, and it's the pull request 3343, if you want to take a look on the discussions. And what we receive now is that it will be native, it will have likely native support in Hyperledger Fabric 3.0. So uh, we, we actually have all the conditions uh, so far to, to actually get the, the, the digital artifacts that are being produced by the digital um, uh, 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 the, the digital metrological devices uh, that are already in place by in Metro here in Brazil and actually attach that to, to a blockchain. Okay, so this is an example of, of the digital certificate standard that we are we are using. Okay, so what, what I what I can tell you here is that we are actually let me see where is it? Oh, the doesn't show here the oh the key. Oh, we have here the attributes, okay, that we need to put on, on the certificate. And then we have the, the elliptic curve that we are using. And that's actually a digital certificate that we produce and that we already try uh, uh, to run a network in, 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 in a testing scenario here at the Federal University of Santa Catarina. And our proposal then is that uh, for the creation of a blockchain of metrological receipts, okay, the idea is that every single metrological device that is network capable would be able to cast their uh, uh, their metrological artifacts into a blockchain. And with that, we'll be able actually to track use and possibly calibration and devise some new strategies for regulators when they are using calibrated devices and connected devices. So going back uh, uh, to fuel pumps, uh, we we may use that blockchain to deliver uh, uh, tax avoidance strategies. Okay, if we know uh, everything that is being uh, filled up by a gas station, then we know uh, uh, the, the 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 revenue and, and custom systems here. They know how much fuel they are buying. If we can track all the all the uh, receipts on that blockchain, they would be able to understand if they are actually selling more. Uh, uh, feel than they are actually buying because this is also a tax avoidance uh, uh, problem. Uh, another thing that we also realized that maybe we can do some some process with on-chain and off-chain devices to indicate uh, problems with mixtures in fuel. Like here in Brazil, we 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 have a, 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 a fuel ratio mixture between ethanol and and, and petrol that varies. Sometimes our cars can deal with almost anything. Uh, but uh, whenever you're buying uh, a petrol, you should pay something. Whenever you're buying ethanol, you pay a different amount. And what we what we believe is that once uh, people cannot uh, cheat the system using volume, they probably will start cheating with the mixtures. And we believe that putting all that into a blockchain may allow us to give out indications that there are problems by having metrological uh, uh, art, artifacts, we can tell problems on other things like the mixtures. That is not a, a metrological problem. Okay, so uh, that was what I, I had to bring you. We are now running some experiments with, with that, but uh, we have basically no idea when this will be actually feasible in here. But um, that, that, that's it. So I try to be quick so that we have space for questions. So thank, thank you. Thank you, all. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I know that you are in an, uh, organize another event at the same time. Um, if you, if the, the 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 people would like to make a question, you could put on the on the chat. Let me see if there is something on the chat to any question. Um, I didn't see no question at time. Well, um, yeah, people, people can raise their hands, open the microphone. Yeah. I can deal with questions in Spanish as well and in Portuguese. 
because my, my event here that I'm organizing is running in Spanish. So. There is a question from uh, on the chat. Like, Does the yeah. system require customer participation for the blockchain to track metrological uh, integrity? Uh, now, as we are conducting with the, the system as, is, as it is, okay, uh, with the app that runs on the, the, on the customer's uh, uh, phone, yes. But our idea is that we may be able to uh, force the, the, the equipment to actually turn every single measurement to the blockchain, okay? And then we can track if the measurement, if there is a missing measurement, we can actually identify and, and maybe suspend the, the operation of that specific equipment. So there, there are some strategies for that, okay? Uh, the blockchain strategy would not have customer participation. What has customer participation is today's system with the app, okay? So... I have a question. Uh, who will be the nodes in, in this blockchain in, for the... Yeah, I... In, in fact, we, we, we haven't decided exactly, okay? But uh, the nodes, uh, in, in this case, they, uh, they... There may be, in Metro, there may be the, the state uh, uh, parts of the metrological systems. I forgot their names in here. I'm, Ipen. 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 Yeah. Exactly. So every state in Brazil has like a, 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 a an institute for for measurements. So they may be uh, uh, nodes that will be collecting data on their geographical uh, reference and then pulling all that into a network. Okay. And with that, we be, we may be able to 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 track more precisely some of these things. You have uh, another question. You have a, a project with uh, education ministry with the certificates, the university certificates. In yes. this case, uh, the nodes are the universities. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The, the thing is, uh, what, what we are trying here is to establish a standard uh, federal government blockchain strategy. Okay. So, for example, metrology would be one of the consortiums of that specific network. Okay, we already we already have the network running with education, so uh, uh, we actually uh, uh, are dealing with the higher education degree certificates these days in Brazil. They are completely digital, and what we are doing is tracking them using a nationwide blockchain, and the nodes in there are are uh, universities. But we already have now in course a, a new uh, consortium inside the same network that is on, on health, okay? So we are tracking now prescriptions and controlled prescriptions for Anvisa, that is our uh, sanitary regulation agency here. And, and basically what we want to understand is people having digital uh, prescriptions, not using them twice, okay? Because that's... Uh, if you if you have like a digital prescription for a controlled drug and you use twice, the second time you are actually dealing uh, de dealing some drugs, okay? Because you don't have the proper authorization for that. And then metrological will be just only a new uh, a new um, a new consortium into that that people may be able to tap. And then fiscal will be able to tap that and check fiscal and and like oil and gas would be maybe be another consortium that will tap into the fuel pumps to know if there is a mixture problem within fuel. The idea is that making information available will allow other uh, sectors in Brazil to use it. And another question, if there is no on the, the chat, uh, what about the, the, uh, the confidential of the information? If you are going to put the information on, on, a, on a blockchain, Every node could see the information. How could you prevent the um, the property of that information to not be shared to everybody? Yeah, usually in terms of metrological devices, uh, they do not have a, a, like privacy leakage in, in in one single use. Okay, we may have traces that would 
allow for identification of certain customer behaviors. But uh, it's very difficult to pinpoint a person by looking only to like the fuel pumps uh, uh, registry. I would know that that the the, the 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 gas station has a behavior, but then it's a company, it's not a person, so it's not protected by any of these privacy laws. Uh, when we do that with uh, uh, with prescriptions and with uh, degree certificates, uh, block, uh, uh, Hyperledger has a strategy of private collections. So what happens is that we track the information on blockchain level, but we exchange the actual data with private information using this private collection strategy that is, is, is somewhat like a, a, a synchronous uh, uh, object storage strategy that has a level of encryption for you to send information from one node to the other uh, without going through on-chain information that could be brought to these uh, on the same way. Okay, uh, any, anyone who would like to make a question, you could put on the chat. Otherwise, I, I will, uh, thanks. Uh, yeah. Now there is a, a, a question here from Marcelo. There will be integration with the full distrib distributivos companheiro, distribution com companies. Uh, in fact, we, we actually, uh, uh, our idea is that we start tracking fuel pumps then it's very likely that the fuel distribution companies, they they have another in-metro certified device that will actually fill up the, 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 the trucks that are distributing the fuel. So if that guy does a digital signature on their metrological interaction, then we can add that to, his, to a slightly different contract in the chain and have that as a... As a, as a another tracking point for the whole system. So it, it, it will depend, okay, how how this would work in the future. But the, the more we collect, the more data we can provide, the more functionality we can provide with that. As a coordinator of the project inside the Metro, we, we really don't have a, a, at least at now the model, the business model for the project. We have technological model, but we don't have the 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 business model we are discussing nowadays now how to evolve these projects in 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 business how to uh, may, uh sustain um, financially sustain this project and uh, there is no uh model nowadays um as the, the there is no more questions i would like to thank miss mr martina and uh rodolfo thank you very much i will apologize for everybody but i'll have to to bash off like uh, rodolfo said i i i have an event that is running today in here and and i would like to thank you again for the invitation if those uh, if, if anyone is interested on on that and would like to talk more about that i'm putting my uh, email on on the chat okay so please write me I'll be very happy to explain and show you some of the experiments that we ran so far with that. Okay, so thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Now, uh, before I continue with the next presentation, we are going to take five minutes to let you know about the SIN International Cooperation Project that is currently being worked on on the design and manufacture of an instrument to measure environment conditions in metrological lab laboratories with digit digit digitization criteria. And we need to, you to fill out our survey that will help the group of developers in the technical and function characteristics that should be con considered. Aldo Garcia, the coordinator of this project, has the floor. Go ahead, Aldo. Thank you very much, Rodolfo. Uh, thank you to everyone here in this meeting. Wonderful explanation. Thank you very much, Jean. Um, so th thank you for these minutes. I'm going to share with you, with all the community here in this meeting, a survey 
Uh, this survey will help uh, to the, the de development of the project of the CIMBID project uh, re regarding uh, uh, THB uh, thermohydrobarometer uh, that we are developing among different NMIs in CIM region. So we want to take advantage that uh, are here united uh, a very important uh, members of SIM community and other other important uh, participants. So I want to take advantage and ask you uh, for your feedback and your knowledge in this survey. This will help us a lot. And let me tell you that this will be uh, in some way we are going to to give you the the the, the follow-up of this development in order to understand that your help uh, will uh, will be very grateful and we are going to uh, take in, into account in the development of our uh, THB. So I'm going to send you uh, through the chat a survey. Uh, I, I will be very grateful with you if you can help us. And uh, thank you very much for the organizers. Rodolfo, thank you very much for your time in this wonderful M4DT day and the, and the coordinators, Carlos, as well. Thank you very much for for all of you, if you have some doubts, please send me an email. I, I have uh, just uh, placed my email if you have some questions or, or you are interested in participate in this. Thank you very much and wonderful, wonderful and for TD Day for the blockchain. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aldo, for sharing this information. Please fill out the, this survey, which takes no more than five minutes to complete. This information will be very useful for the project developers. The, the link for the survey is on the, on the chat. Next presentation, the title of the following presentation is Blockchain in Legal Metrology and Inter-NMI Network. Ms. Mabuba Moni from PTB will be the speaker. Since 2019, Mabuba Moni has been a scientific employee of, I try only once to pronounce this, Fiscalist Technist Bundestag PTB in Germany in the area of legal metrology. She has worked on cutting edge technologies to improve the security, privacy and scalability features of blockchain technology. Using the Hyperledger Fabric framework, she also expands her expertise in designing private blockchain applications. Mabuba actively supports and works with national and international notified bodies to test, examine, and implement the smart contracts. She received her Master of Science degree in communication and media engineering from, try again, Hoshi Schul of Offenburg. Yeah. <laughs> okay, German. <laughs> Welcome, Ms. Mabuba. I, I hope that I pronounced your name correctly. Yes, uh, thank you. Go ahead with your presentation. Yeah. So can you see my screen also, Rodolfo? Yes. OK, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me. Yeah, so I will start my presentation. Uh, so in my next few minutes, I will talking. I will be talking about uh, what is the digitalization uh, relationship with legal metrology. Also, how we are actually developing some uh, applications using blockchain. So till now, we have two type of use cases which used uh, this blockchain application. So uh, in Germany, particularly, we are uh, more concerned about privacy. So also, uh, that's why we also need to uh, provide more security and privacy stuffs for these uh, uh, applications. So one of the major uh, smart meter is, um, uh, is a topic uh, for the legal metrology field. So they try to also improve the security features for the smart, smart meter, which is also a part of legal metrology. 
And another use case is uh, already Jan was discussing about it, that uh, public infrastructure for smart meters. So which we actually collaborated with in, in Metro for this project. And we will be discussing about implementation and results time to time. Yeah. So. So basically what happens in the legal metrology area is that there are a lot of measuring instruments coming in and all of them has maximum has this cloud connection and which actually require the new solutions to cover the requirement and also uh, which is related to the legal metrology field. And that's why we need to develop some kind of innovative solution which can extend and merge these novel technologies. So why blockchain technology? Because um, uh, last four and five years, there were a lot of uh, interesting work going on through this technology because it gives you this immutable append-only data structure, uh, which, is, uh, which is also providing us a lot of transparency. And basically all the blocks are uh, cryptographically linked, and it also provides some kind of platform for distributed systems. And there is a term for a smart contract, which is uh, providing the execution and automation of the workflow. So you can write your logical uh, preparation in that smart contract and also use that in time to time for the executing the workflow. And another important feature is uh, that uh, you can actually establish the trust where there is no trust. Need, uh, you do not need to trust each other, but you can trust the independent parties. So that's why uh, blockchain technology is also interesting for PTB uh, to research on the, this area. So by considering that in our mind, uh, as we were uh, uh, also focused on uh, confidentiality of the uh, client section, and also we wanted to make sure that how can we uh, improve the privacy because uh, in blockchain, as you already know that it's uh, uh, public, so uh, it can be public and private, but like uh, mostly it is uh, the use is that it is trans it will give you the transparency. So you somehow need to give uh, some information as a public. Uh, but at the same time, uh, when we want to use it in the enterprise section, then we need some kind of privacy. That's why this private blockchain stuff came in and PTB and also I think in uh, national metrology institutes there we are mostly interested on uh, private blockchain so that we can also ensure the privacy. So uh, how can we actually uh, give the uh, blockchain as a privacy? So we try to uh, also go, go through a lot of cryptographic materials like um, homomorphic en encryption, functional encryption to enhance the privacy in the blockchain. So we combine these two technologies. So why it is needed? Because um, uh, in the market uh, also there are in current, especially in the when, when as a regulating authorities, when we uh, try to verify the software in this current state, uh, we have this uh, system, we check only the system integrity and uh, mostly the hardware is physically sealed. And we also check this integrity by calculating the checksum over the, all the files. And this checksum can be manipulated without even breaking the seal. So to prevent this, actually, the authorities regularly require the recertification to do this. And also it is sometimes inconvenient for the stakeholders because uh, even for the minor correction or minor bug fixes, you always need to go through this recertification process. So what we need then, uh, we need a verification method, method which can uh, verify the binary image itself, uh, not only the binary image, but also the functionality in that particular system. So uh, for for our proposal was that we wanted to propose an alternative model uh, for a smart metering system, which will be a combination of uh, functional encryption and blockchain technology. And why we want to do this? Because uh, of course, a smart meter is a, a very complex system when you add the security in that uh, stuffs. So our aim is also that uh, whether we can reduce the complexity itself so that we can achieve any high level uh, metrological security and examine the, all the possibilities and limits of uh, blockchain and functional encryption for this simplified model. And uh, our uh, target was to give the solution which can give us the data authenticity of the measurement results and also the privacy of the measurement result. 
and so that we can integrate you uh, also another is the integrity of the algorithm uh, establishing confidence of correctness of measurement so uh, in this particular use case, we proposed um, a concept. Uh, this is basically the classical, uh, uh, classic smart metering system, which has a lot of uh, several, it can consist of several sensors uh, that actually produce measurement values in given time intervals. And uh, in this particular use case, we, we actually consider that these sensors are classified as trustworthy. And it is already regularly checked by the manipul uh, uh, checked by the market surveillance for the manipulation. And from here, the sensor is actually connected to the gateway directly. And uh, uh, there are provider who is who is actually basically the energy providers who is actually interested for the um, uh, consumption of the customer. And uh, at the end, they need to provide the billing uh, to the customer and customer who is actually consuming the energy itself and uh, some other application for the displaying the results can be there. So this is a typical classical system, mostly. And um, there is a gateway. So gateway actually here represents the central unit, which is basically storing and further processing of this measurement data. Uh, so in typically this happens. And so in this model, we wanted to uh, integrate the blockchain. Uh, so blockchain actually we wanted to use as an immutable and redundant storage for measurement data. And also we will implement, uh, uh, also we have implemented already the uh, functional encryption to uh, maximize the privacy of measurement data. So, okay, I already talked about functional encryption, but what is it actually? So functional encryption is also similar to homomorphic en encryption, so which actually allows the calculations to be uh, performed in the, on the encrypted data. So if you see from the picture here, the customer has kind of a, a secret key and customer has actually the owner of the measurement data in this case. Yeah, because he generates the uh, measurement value himself. So secret, he generates a secret key and public key by himself and he shared this public key to the sensor. So sensor actually uh, uh, kind of um, uh, insert any measurement data with its public key whenever he, uh, he or she sends the data. It's, it sends the measurement data. And customer, uh, because in functional encryption, there is an algorithm. So uh, with these algorithms, um, uh, uh, in the uh, customer also can um, uh, generate uh, with his secret key, there is an evaluation key, but that is separate. And this evaluation key is actually <clears throat> uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, created by the uh, uh, tariff model. Suppose uh, some provider has some different type of tariffs. So this can this will be mutual consideration of both of them. And this evaluation key is generated by that lot of uh, algorithm stuffs. And uh, in this case, actually, when uh, so we get the results from uh, we get the measurement value from the sensors we know. And also when the provider is uh, seeing that your yeah, customer is generating this much of uh, amount of energy or this much of, much of uh, uh, measurement value, he can actually use his uh, evaluation key to decrypt the results because he only need the billing result that how much uh, he or she has consumed. So, um, so he needs that amount and that actually uh, 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 can be uh, because in functional encryption, you you perform all the mm, calculation on encrypted data, but you decrypt uh, when you uh, because it provides because in the decryption method, it it actually give you the plain text result as a calculation. So this way, we actually try to guarantee the integrity of the algorithm that evaluation because evaluation is uh, key is tied to this function. And also we combine this um, blockchain technology in this uh, system because we wanted to give the transparency and also it's a kind of a storage system in our case. So uh, also we used Hyperledger Fabric um, for the blockchain framework implementation, uh, which is already hosted by Linux Foundation. And it uh, to use this because first of all, it is permission based and it has modular architecture and uh, it has membership service provider, which is actually uh, generating some crypto materials and uh, uh, giving um, uh, some private uh, credentials for each clients. Uh, 
And also it has channel feature means like interestingly you can really integrate um, uh, uh, different different nodes, but they will be just talking with each other. But uh, if I don't want to share my stuff to other, I can also hide. And there is a smart contract facilities so, which is using chain code and there are some endorsement policies. So that's why we chose Hyperledger Fabric for our project. So what is our goal for this implementation? What do we want to achieve actually? Uh, basically, we wanted to find the performance blockchain uh, bottlenecks of uh, minimal minimal configuration of Hyperledger Fabric because it's a huge framework. So uh, we need to really uh, focus on that where I can get the maximum amount of help from Hyperledger Fabric. Yeah. So th this was also important that we get uh, we we do some performance test uh, performance test so that um, we are sure that what we want to achieve whether it is overheading our um, system or 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 it's just fine that we can use it so this was the goal and also uh, we wanted to check the feasibility that in given limitation like if we wanted to reduce any computing capacity of measuring device or even timing uh, how it affects my system so and um, uh, for this, we actually, uh, it was like really hopeful results because it was, although it was not that we really implemented in a smart meter gateway, but uh, we we tried to do this in com computational tasks so that uh, we can uh, some, some kind of, uh, uh, we can show that this proof of concept is working. So we tried with, first of all, uh, 48 clients to uh, in different multi-threaded system and at a, when uh, the parallel in instances were working so we uh, kind of uh, tried to measure the uh, maximum cpu capacity how much is it taking the uh, uh, space consumption or or how much is is it uh, really uh, working or or how it can break. So in our experiments till now, when we get the perfect results up to eight clients, uh, which is still feasible because in a smart meter uh, system, the measurement value actually needs to, because you need to get the value in 15 minute in interval. That is natural procedure. So even if I, if my whole blocking, adding stuffs is taking time, it's, it's still, it, it can be a real life solution because we have that calculation that okay, uh, uh, if we give uh, suppose uh, is, if my if I wanted to measure the value whether it is integrated in timely or it taking too much time. So in minimum condition it is still working fine, but of course we need a lot of work on that, and also we need to. Uh, check that when we use some high computing capacity, uh, capacity whether how this blockchain uh, stuffs work. So by having this mind, we have this use case too. So where uh, all the, uh, we wanted uh, our, our fellow uh, uh, colleagues uh, from Wilson Mello from InMetro, uh, it was really nice working with him and uh, Richard R. Machado, yeah. So, this PKI stuffs was also another task, uh, which was also collaboration from uh, with InMetro because um, we we were aware that in InMetro uh, they were facing these issues that they really need to implement this PKI in blockchain systems to prevent the fraud. Yeah, so I will just shortly go through this uh, PKI that why what it is even. So uh, basically for the smart meters, uh, uh, there should be a need of digital certificates so that you can trust that this is smart meters is uh, authenticate and uh, this is uh, the real smart meter. And there is uh, in PKI system, there is always like certificate authority and this register authority. So certificate authority, they issue, they stores and sign the digital certificate. And for register authority, they verify the identify uh, they have verified the identity and the interface between the CA and the user. But there are some uh, drawbacks of it because uh, in CA based PKI, uh, you have to always uh, depend on this trusted third party. Yeah. And to manage the digital certificates, also sometimes it can be complex because you need to generate uh, public and private key, and it's it's really uh, sometimes difficult for the measuring device, which are uh, which are not very computational high. So uh, it can be expensive for those type of device. So 
we need some kind of uh, solution that how can we even achieve. If we want to improve our security in this type of device, uh, we need to also provide some solution. So for a smart meter also, if we want to give this uh, PKI system, it, it is of course very beneficial because it will um, increase the uh, integrity, authenticity and non-repudiation. And also of course it will re, uh, improve the reliability because PKI is of course very well known and um, um, secured system. And uh, so also in legal metrology, it will improve the control activity, which is already software controlled measuring instruments and it will help to prevent frauds and tampering with measurements. So basically in traditional CA versus blockchain based, uh, PKI is uh, uh, there is um, uh, in because in traditional CA based you have this manufacturer we request who, who requests the digital certificate and provides the public key and she he comes to the register authority for uh, uh, to check his information and uh, register authority inspects the smart meter and endorses the request then it goes to the certification authority and he uh, or she issues the digital certificate and attests to verification and when this uh, smart meters have this certification then society is trusting that here yeah, i trust ca i trust ra i trust the digital certificate and i trust the smart meter but we just try to give this alternative solution as a blockchain based because in manufacturer, uh, this is the same procedure, but uh, here the permission endorser is uh, uh, checking the information, inspects the smart meter and endorses the transaction. But here actually we are eliminating the certification authority because we don't need it here uh, uh, to issue the certificate only because uh, the permission endor endorsers in Hyperledger Fabric or in blockchain based system, he is already doing this task and he is um, uh, adding this valid block to the blockchain system and society can then check the blockchain system because we consider that each one has that node and peer and it doesn't have to be a, a very high computing device or something. It can be just one node. So this is how they can uh, check the blockchain system and they can trust the smart meter. So uh, proof of implementation, concept implementation, we did uh, with the uh, elective card digital signature algorithm, the whole system. And so the registering of the smart meter is also on blockchain. It is stores and permission endorsers inserting the public keys. And a smart contract is written in Hyperledger Fabric, which verify the sing uh, digital signatures and receive the meter ID and signature digest. So here is our inter-NMI network currently. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, we have uh, five nodes right now. So from uh, a PTB, one is Germany, another, another is Czech Republic, uh, then NMIJ, and then Malaysia, NMIM. Uh, there is one uh, uh, virtual node from Microsoft Azure and from Brazil, of course, Brazil, we have two nodes. So we have this um, uh, five nodes currently uh, running. So uh, everybody is actually connected to PTB, but well, what is needed is like uh, we wanted to uh, integrate all the nodes to each other so that why it is needed because blockchain needs a more scalable solution because it takes time and when there are a lot of uh, uh, nodes are connecting with either each other we can really um, uh, test that what is the bottleneck of performance so this is how we are working so and uh, uh, one experimentation already went for um, uh, orchestration tool, and this is um, um, within Metro we have done. Uh, so in Hyperledger Fabric, there are two ty three type of uh, implementation. One is like you can use the Docker container to run the system, uh, but uh, you can use the peer node uh, individually. You can use the single node. Uh, but like uh, also there is an orchestration tool which helps you to uh, give the physical things as a virtual uh, virtualization stuff so that I can run uh, many nodes in one PC to test. So and uh, also we are using kind of Hyperledger Explorer, which is um, a tool uh, which which comes from Hyperledger, which gives that uh, that uh, that performance test uh, we can see as a visualization. So this is one and this type of uh, when we implemented this um, uh, PKI, especially for the blockchain uh, 
uh, stuff. So we actually uh, took blockchain as a store and attached the public key from smart meters and meters sign their measurement with their private key. And for this, there is no extra cost for digital certificates because you don't go to the certificate authority to um, do this stuff again. And uh, also it doesn't depend on trust uh, third party and blockchain actually do not eliminate actually PKI, but it is uh, interdependent technologies. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Miss. Uh, thank you, Miss. I, <laughs> I wanted to Lauren. finish a little early because we yeah, are time. Yes. Yeah. It's good to, to work with people in Germany that they keep the time very strictly. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. There is a questions on the chat. If 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 someone intend to make a question, you could put on the chat to. And and Miss Money will will answer the question. Uh, Alexis Pauki uh, asks when the system is working, the workload for the NMI will increase. I I I, su I suppose that the workload of the internet. Uh, so when the system is working, the workload for the NMI will increase. Um, it means like the workload for the employees or or workload of the system. Alex, could you could you could make the question by on the mi microphone? Uh, uh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I understand that the system has the consequence that you will not need any certification body anymore. But the certification bodies are fulfilling a function, and this is taken over only by the blockchain, or is also taken over by the NMI. So the NMI has to do more tasks than uh, it is uh, doing uh, today. Or, or uh, because it... in uh, yeah, I get it. Uh, for the uh, because uh, when you see there was yeah registration authority, and that is basically kind of NMIs. Yeah, we check and then we uh, say uh, that this system is valid. So it's not that um, when we are not taking over the uh, work from CA. So we are basically el eliminating that with the technology itself. Yeah, in this particular example. So this is of, of course to reduce the workload itself. Mm -hmm. so because so register uh, mm -hmm. when something is not functioning well, <laughs> the technology will not help. Uh, yeah. human, human beings have to inter intervene and this is done by the certification bodies today. Mm -hmm. So what yes. if something is not working well or there's some questioning then that will be taken over by the NMI that is more work for the NMI. Yeah, but like uh, it's a system we are trying to develop yeah so if it works perfectly because when certification authority because uh, they can be also manipulative right sometimes so uh, the workload i think it will be the topic of next five years right <laughs> if we if we really implement this <laughs> well the uh the the project of uh, that uh, Mr. Jean Martinez uh, speak, Mr. Jean Martinez speaks is about a, is a kind of smart meter, and the idea is to remotely uh, uh, discover where are the suspects of uh, are doing fraud or or some bad thing in the gas pump. So it will help. Uh, the idea is to help the the NMI. To pinpoint the place that we we are going to send a people a person, uh, uh, a metrologist to see if it's all right or no. So that the idea is making uh, a smart fiscalization. Yeah. Anyone else would like to to make a question? I have one. Uh, what what kind of what type of smart meters are you considering to to first use uh, to implement to make it a, a pilot or test? Uh, uh, probably the electric meters is the most yeah, topic in in Germany. Yeah, electric meter. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, in ca the mm -hmm. case of Brazil, the the project that we are discussing of gas pump, 
uh, starts 15 years ago in uh, electric metering, but the price mm -hmm. of using the PKI, PKI, PKI uh, we don't, uh, it's about uh, 30, 40 dollars uh, mm -hmm. using this texture from the, the ten dollars, the, the less than ten dollars, if it is the, the less expensive possible, uh, with a large uh, uh, customer base. Uh, uh, but uh, nowadays, it's about uh, is a starting project, the new process about fifteen dollar, fifty dollars, uh, mm -hmm. increase in the price of the pro product. So that this is uh, it, it's impossible to increase at uh, fifty dollars in. Uh, customer smart meat because of the price of the product. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of uh, considerations of uh, price. Yeah, uh, it's same here also. Mm -hmm. and because uh, that's why uh, we wanted to uh, use the technology that we can also reduce the price and um, uh, not the electricity price, like the system we develop, somehow we can cut down the price from there to increase probably somewhere else. Hmm. Okay, anyone else has a, a question? Let me see. I don't think so. So thanks, Ms. Mabuba, for your presentation. Yeah, thank and, you very much. And for answer the questions. And now the next speaker is also from PTB, German. Uh, he will present the talk blockchain and e-voting and I will present then Mr. Daniel Peters. Since 2018, he's head of the working group of embedded metrology system at the German National Metrology Institute. I will not try to pronounce it again. PTB in Berlin. Uh, his group is doing IT security training and consulting for international metrology institutes research on blockchain solutions based on Impelagic fab, 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 Fabric, create security virtualization environments and the software testing for measurement instruments under legal control. Uh, welcome, welcome, Mr. Daniel. Thanks for your participation in this event and go and go ahead with your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Rudolfo. Thank you for the kind introduction. I hope everything will work now. Because I had some problems, I have like many accounts, one from my university where I lecture, one from my work, my private one, so the teams went crazy, it always threw me out. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes we can. Okay, let me see if I can go full screen. And it's also full screen, yes? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, let me just start because we don't have so much time. So in Germany, the Physikalisch Technische Bundesanstalt, the PTP, is actually the uh, National German Metrology Institute. And uh, metrology, in the sense, we're also looking, looking at e-voting because uh, the law says that counting votes accurately is also some kind of uh, metrology. I don't know how it is in other countries, but this is how Germany handles it. And that's why we also do uh, research in e-voting. And if I go back, like you see my, my title here, it's blockchain and e-voting. So I want to talk about how can we construct a secure and private e-voting schemes on the blockchain. So I hope I'm not too much off topic. I said in Germany, actually, Metrology Institute is doing it. There will be a lot about uh, IT security and a lot about privacy. Yeah. So let me start. Electronic voting is an online process in which registered voters cast their vote from an electronic device, it can be, for example, a uh, mobile, mobile phone, and transmit it via the internet to an electronic ballot box, so the bulletin board. And in our sense, the bulletin board, where do I have my slides? Wait a minute. I cannot see my, my window anywhere. You can see it, yeah? I see can, can, what is e-voting. Uh, like... you, can, you can still see it. I don't know. I clicked yes. on the window and then all of a sudden it threw me out again. It's crazy. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
So just give, give me a second. Let me see. If I if I go next, you see the next slide. Uh, no, it's in in the same. What is e voting? What is e voting? Yeah. Windows. So I I will stop sharing and I will share again. So give me a second. I'm watching your. Uh, okay, so okay. Now, now you can see it, yeah. And uh, what is he voting? Is the same okay, slide? Okay, so mm -hmm. next, next slide. Okay, okay. Now, now I just shared my screen. I'm sorry for the delay. <laughs> So go. challenges uh, in e-voting. Um, what are the challenges in such a scheme? It's uh, of course we want to have a transparent system, so the voters should, should see their ballot, but it shouldn't be transparent in the sense that another voter can see what you elected. So if you have an election system, uh, you have your uh, you give a, your vote, and it should be just visible to you. But in the in the end, when you tally together the votes, when you count them all together, the voters should be. Uh, should be sure that their vote was counted and everything was correct. So you have on the one side, you have the transparency. On the other side, it should be, of course, private. Yeah. So the vote of uh, each voter should be anonymous. The other side is also the other two is forgery proof and practically usable. So it should be easy to use. But in the background, you should have uh, very complicated algorithms. It's put it like this complex algorithms in IT security that make it uh, forgery proof. So it should be unhackable in a sense, but it's it's also uh, contrary if it's practically usable. So it should look very easy and easy understandable for a, for a voter. But in the, in the same sense, in the background, there should be complex algorithms running. This is this is what we what we think about when we construct the system to make the user interface nice and easy to use. But in the sense from the back end, we have. Uh, a system that runs a lot of uh, algorithms in the background that the user should trust in a way. Yeah. Okay, let's get to the IT mechanisms we use in our system. So uh, these are like signatures. If, if you know signatures in general, a signature uh, is uh, something that uh, if you sign it, you have a public key, you have a private key. If you use your uh, private key to sign a message, you want to send something to somebody, the other end can check your message with your public key. So it just uh, there's normally like a hash at the end, like uh, it's uh, the whole um, data you're sending is put together in let's say 128 bits, and these bits they are signed after with your private key. And then if uh, a user looks at it that receives the message, has your public key. And then can see how the data that was sent is actually from the person I was expecting. And if the signature is not correct, uh, it's, it's not from the person. If we talk about blind signatures, we're talking about a system where somebody else actually signing the message. So we have a user is sending the message to, to a server. And in our sense, if you think about voting, this message is actually the ballot. It's actually where uh, the voting, uh, what you voted is uh, actually written into the message. But you don't want the server to actually know what you have written in. And here, the scheme blind signatures, signatures come into place. You can let the server sign something that the server didn't see before. So I, I could actually send my vote to a system. The system signs the vote with their private key, with their signature, and then I get the vote back. And with this vote afterwards, I can put it in the ballot box. And when somebody afterwards looks at my vote, uh, it will see the signature. We look at the signature, see that it's from a trusted authority, like from, from the server that signed it, and then we'll count the vote. If it's not from this uh, authority, we'll not count the vote. And this is interesting for to, to avoid a double voting. Yeah. So you only want the, the voter to vote once. This is why the voter has to go to some kind of uh, authority, send the vote to it, and then get a signature. And this signature, only with that one, it, it can vote. And if it would send another uh, vote to this uh, authority, the authority would know through a list, ah, you already voted. If you know in the normal system now, if you go to the ballot box, normally there's a list, they cross your name of the list, you cannot go a second time. And this is also this kind of sense of blind signatures. I only get my signature once, and if I have my message with my signature, then I can throw it to the ballot box, I said to the um, bulletin board, uh, which can then be a, a blockchain that is 
uh, saving all the uh, all the uh, votes that come in that have a valid signature. So this is one scheme we actually use. So the blind signatures. Another one is a distributed ledger technology. It's more or less another word for blockchain. So if you have a blockchain, like uh, my pre uh, um, speakers already told you, it's like a ledger. It's like uh, let's say a database that you write into. And it has the uh, uh, ability, if you write something into that database, it cannot be manipulated anymore. You cannot uh, erase it anymore. Uh, it's there for fix because the whole system is taking care of this database. And if the system is correct, if normally more than 50% of the users that take care of the blockchain uh, are uh, using the blockchain correctly, you are not able to, to change anything that you put in the ledger. And this is also good, of course, in voting because if you have a vote, if it's in there, nobody should be able to erase it again. Then the third thing is mixed networks. Uh, in parentheses, onion encryption. I, I have some slides to it. I, I will keep it short here. Mixed network. If you send something, uh, it, it's like a Tor network, like an anonymity network. If you want to send a package from A to B, you are A. You want to send it to your friend who's B. Let's call him Alice and Bob. And if Alice wants to send it to Bob, Alice first goes through these mixed networks. It's uh, it's encrypting their, its message through the servers, let's say for three layers, if there are three servers on the way, and then the servers decrypt the message and also permutate it. So they, they mix the messages they receive. And at the end, if somebody is just looking at the network, uh, nobody will know that A sends something to B. So Alice sends something through Bob because it's going through this server network that is uh, decrypting message and mixing them again. And at the end, you have like scrambled, uh, a scrambled network where nobody really understands which package is going to to uh, to which receiver, which uh, which sender is sending something to which receiver. This is also very interesting, uh, of course, for e-voting because you want to hide the IP address of a, of a voter. So when the voter sends their vote afterwards to the ballot box, to the, to the let's say, to the ledger. Then uh, if I have the IP address, perhaps afterwards I can see, okay, this person actually voted. I have its IP address. I can look it, look him up or look her up, look at this up and then see, okay, she actually voted at the time and then I can, can make assumptions. And normally you shouldn't know if a voter actually voted and when they voted. So this is why we use the mixed networks to, to scramble the data. So it's not really known who's voting when and how and, and through what. Then the fourth thing is zero knowledge proofs. So these are all like these mathematical IT security constructs in the background. It's like complex algorithms that uh, are uh, that are proven to be correct. So this is normally, if you think about it in, in IT security, you still have to trust someone on the system that there are one-way functions. We are not uh, quite sure if there are these, are these NPNP problems we rely on a, a lot. And uh, also other problems, we rely on the fact that, okay, there are one-way functions. If I have like a, a function, I can easily compute it in one way, but I cannot compute back, like, like the, the hash fun functions like private key and public key, uh, uh, cryptography, everything is based on some mathematical construct that we, that we can generate functions that go one way but cannot go uh, back easily the other way. And if, if you have this, then you can construct these uh, IT security schemes. I'm talking here uh, right now, if you have like these one-way functions, you can generate secure functions that uh, make cryptography possible. And with zero knowledge proof, also such a scheme is you want to show something to somebody without revealing the data. In this sense, for example, when I'm voting, I want to show that I just elected for one president, so for, for one candidate. I Because if I give my ballot and then I elected for two, my ballot is not valid anymore. And for zero knowledge proof, without showing whom I elected, for whom I whom I chose in my, uh, in my vote, I still can make sure that I just chose one candidate. So these are what zero knowledge proofs are doing. You you reveal uh, you reveal that you did something correct without revealing the secret. Uh, then the other aspect is identity-based cryptography. Here is interesting if you have a passport or you have your ID card. Identity-based means that you can uh, identify somebody by his personal data. And normally, if it's uh, implemented correctly, you don't even need a public key infrastructure anymore. So with identity-based cryptography, if you think about your ID card, if it has a chip, 
Uh, you trust the chip manufacturer, you have like some identity data on it. Through this identity data, you can generate the public key without looking into the public key infrastructure. We didn't implement that uh, in our infrastructure, but it's interesting. I still wrote it bold. Everything that is bold is used in our infrastructure normally. We also have a public key infrastructure implemented that uh, does these things, but it's everything that I'm talking here about. It's not something we use now in Germany. It's just a research uh, project. Because in Germany, we are responsible to check these uh, voting machines, but they don't really exist yet. So what we're doing, we're just doing research. And it was also said uh, by the German government, they're not expecting in the next five years to actually get these voting machines. So we are on a uh, just uh, research-based uh, research grounds here. But in this, in this research, we try to, to look at every solution that is already available. We constructed our own network and that's why we, we don't use this identity-based cryptography through, through uh, ID cards and passports because we don't really have access to it. And another aspect, of course, is asymmetric and symmetric encryption. I already talked about it, uh, that you can encrypt data with a private key, then the other one can decrypt with a public key or the other way around. You Somebody that wants to send you data uh, encrypts it with your public key that is available for everybody. And for example, in the next point, I have the public key infrastructure that you can get from an infrastructure. You can ask for the public key of somebody. If you get it, you can encrypt your data with that public key, and then you're sure only this person, because only this person has the private key, can decrypt the data. This is public uh, and private key um, cryptography. And you also have symmetric enc encryption that you can use, for example, in the mixed network to make it faster. Use a system where you just use one key, it's, it's just faster, but the key you can still encrypt with asymmetric encryption. So somebody that receives it, decrypts it, has the has the symmetric key. Symmetric key just means the key with I with which I encrypt, I can also decrypt. Yeah. And normally, yeah, it's a, uh, it's uh, good if you have two parties that share a key, you can send it. But also if you have parties that don't share a key, you can combine asymmetric encryption with symmetric encryption to make it faster because symmetric encryption is normally faster. As you heard from previous uh, speakers, uh, there are like elliptic curve enc enc encryption, there are the Diffie-Hellman schemes like with discrete logarithms, depending on how secure you want to have it. From the mathematical standpoint, they are all very secure, but like you heard, like uh, Edward Snowden said, uh, there are hooks into, into these functions that make it uh, not secure. It's not the mathematical thing that doesn't make it secure, it's how it was implemented by, for example, NSA or other uh, entities that, that put like uh, specific backdoors into the functions to then afterwards circumvent the, the encryption. Okay, public key infrastructures, I talked about it. You can get the public key from, if you have this infrastructure, uh, you can look at public keys there if it's secure. The hash functions, I also told you when, when we have signatures, hash, hash functions are one-way functions that make out of data, it doesn't matter how big it is, it makes a fixed, uh, a fixed length data, like 128 bits, 256 bits. So you put data in and you get a hash out and normally if the hash is secure, uh, depending on it, it should be it should be collision free, so it shouldn't be able to generate two messages that generate the same hash. So it should be extremely hard, of course, because uh, theoretically it's possible because the hash function is fixed, the data can be infinite, so you will have collisions uh, in uh, in practical. But uh, I mean, you cannot you cannot construct them practically. So normally they are there because the uh, uh, room of the numbers uh, are not the same, but practically. 128 bit is already so big that, that you won't be able to, to guess a collision in that. And then it, you make sure that if you have a hash function, you can directly see that the data you have uh, is from, from that hash. So it's correct because the hash function generated, uh, if I have the data and the hash function, I can easily see for the hash function that everything is correct. Then uh, Mabuba, my colleague from before, she already told you about homomorphic encryption schemes which uh, make it possible to, to calculate on encrypted data. Also interesting for e-voting. So when you want to add afterwards the votes together, you have many people, many voters that uh, put in their ballot box. If, if I don't want to reveal the data beforehand, I can first uh, add everything together in an encrypted, uh, encrypted space. So actually I don't have to decrypt uh, my vote. I voted for a candidate A, 
other person waited for candidate B. Afterwards, when I add them together, I will see, okay, there was one vote for A, one vote for B. If I have a lot of people, like hundreds and two hundreds of people, I will not be able to see anymore, okay, from where did it come from? Because I didn't really decrypt the vote beforehand. I used the encrypted vote, I added together with another encrypted vote, and the result will be the same. This is what homomorphic encryption schemes can do. Also very interesting. And then at the end, when I added everything uh, together in the encrypted space, I can just decrypt it and will receive the result without looking at the individual vote. Another aspect, uh, so this is, I think, like uh, very broad, but very specific uh, introduction into the e-voting uh, community. This is everything that normally is used to, to implement e-voting schemes. The last part is multi-party computations, where you use many servers, like I explained in the mixed networks, to do a computation. And normally it's on, on, on encrypted space. So you use many people that together compute something, like the result of an election, like you have in the blockchain, you can have many nodes that compute it together. At the end, you will just receive the result. Uh, this is multi-party computations. It is also often used. We don't use it in our scheme, but uh, it's also interesting if you are not, if you don't want to be sure just because at the end you will have some some individual like a central authority, an entity that you have to trust to, to look at the identity cards, for example. If you say, okay, I don't want to just trust one server, I can split it to many servers. I can say, okay, I have five or six servers and they work together to do something. So even if one of them is fraud, was hacked or doesn't work correctly, I still will get the correct result if I have a correct multi-party uh, computation scheme that makes it possible, for example, for just three servers to run correctly if I have five servers. So th these, these things exist and uh, they make the overall scheme more reliable because I don't just rely on, on one bottleneck on one server, I can I can split it for many servers. The same, same ideas that you also have with uh, blockchain technology. Okay, so far, a uh, lot uh, to take in uh, with the first functions. Now let's get a little bit more practical uh, how such an uh, e-voting scheme works. What are the entities that uh, want to vote? What are the um, important servers that run? So at the beginning when you vote, you have like uh, your your people like Alice, Bob and Eve. Normally you say like Alice and Bob, they are the good ones. Eve is normally the the bad one, this is how we, we talk in IT security uh, denomination. So it's A, B, E, we just gave, gave, the, gave the letters names. And uh, if you see it, you first have to go to the central authority. So the central authority is the authority that checks your passport. So when I, when I want to first vote, I, I show them my identity. Central authority says, okay, you can vote and they will give you some kind of token. So we have like uh, two kinds of tokens, I, I will explain later on. But the token is like this blind signature I told you before. It's a signature of a random number I gave the central authority. And the central authority will just sign this random number only if I I have not uh, voted before. If I ask the central authority again, if Alice would go again, in this case it's Eve, because Eve is the bad one, would go again and say, I want to vote again. The central authority said, no, you already came to me. I gave you one uh, blind signature. You are not allowed to, to use another one. Then with these blind signatures, so with these tokens, I can use my anonymization network. So the second part of, uh, of the structure, there, there I will send, I also have other slides, I can send my vote in, it, it gets scrambled, like mixed together and comes out at the end. At the end you have the public database, which is the blockchain, where you just put all the votes together. So in, in the normal sense, they would be encrypted till a deadline. So you leave them, then they say, okay, at six o'clock, for example, or 10 o'clock, the vote stops, the election stops. Just then you can, uh, you can decrypt all the data that is on the database, and can show to everybody transparently. They can even find their vote through their token that they send, this random number. They can say, okay, this was my vote actually, but they only only they know this uh, their uh, random number because I said through blind signatures, the central authority ne never saw this random number it signed. And the random number plus the vote they have, they can find it on the database and say, okay, okay, my vote was really counted. Each, each person can do that if they want to. And at the end, they can even see that all these votes were correctly added together. Yeah. Blinded signatures, I don't want to go into too much detail because I explained it uh, at the beginning. It's like, okay, I can, I can send a random number to my central authority. 
The central authority signs that number with uh, its uh, private key, but it cannot see the message I sent to it. So the the, um, uh, the random number L is generated in this case is not shown to the central authorities. Through mathematical constructs, I send it scrambled to it. It can generate some code that then will be the correct signature of the data I didn't see, which is helpful in our scheme because then, okay, really the central authority just gave Alice now the possibility to vote without seeing its its token that it's generated. And this is one token. It's the initial voting token. We call it uh, IVT. And we have the NUT, so the network usage token. It's for denial of service attacks that uh, if, if that I showed you before, that it doesn't use the network too much, the network we use afterwards. We have a, a special token that is also generated by central authority for each uh, voter after time in a, in a time frame, it says, okay, you can only vote now for 100 times, let's say, in, uh, in I don't know, five minutes. Because why should a voter actually do, do more votes? Normally, it's just voting once. But in our scheme, it's possible, which I will also show you through a uh, um, hash chain that you can generate to, to afterwards change your vote. So you can vote once, this initial voting token, but then you can have uh, on this initial voting token, because you know your random number, you can chain them together through a hash function. And then at the end, when you uh, decrypt the votes, you will just uh, use the last vote that is in this uh, hash chain to be counted. The others are all not valid anymore. In this sense, we can make it possible for a voter, even if they already voted, which is in the normal system not possible, they can still change their mind till the deadline is over. Because, okay, I, I can open the the voting booth now for two weeks. Perhaps I want to vote now, uh, like like in a in a mail system where where I cast my vote by mail. I will cast it through the internet, and after one week I will say, no, I'm not not okay with the candidate anymore. I can change it. Yeah, and this is why we have the the second token that nobody actually tries to overload the system with artificial votes. That it doesn't want to make it. It needs this network usage usage token to first have the permission to use the network. And then we can define like, okay, a user shouldn't use it more than a specific time per minute. And if this, this is the case, the network will never be overloaded. And if people use it normally, they will not change their uh, their vote every minute. It's normally okay. It's once, twice, three times. And uh, this is what the network usage token is actually doing. It's limiting your your availability to to vote a lot in a, in a specific time frame to not go into denial of service attacks yeah, to the servers. Then I talked about uh, the ballot encryption system. So it's it's the it's the mixed net, and in the mixed net you have many servers. You see it here. If you have a ballot, you encrypt it. If it goes through free service three times, and we made it here like in a green envelope, yellow envelope, and red envelope. I put it in, I encrypt it once with the server, my ballot will go through, then I en encrypt this whole thing again with the public key of the second server I want to send it, and then I encrypt it with the public uh, key of the third server. If I do, do this, if you see it, uh, I can then use my mixnet because I have here the vote, which is now in the red envelope. If we go back, you see it here was the red envelope was the last one. So the first server has the private key to decrypt the red envelope. It sends it to the second server here in the network, which has the private key to decrypt the yellow envelope. And then it goes to the last one, uh, the green one, uh, which has the has the last key, which can decrypt the last layer. And if we have a lot of votes going and we actually fix it through time slots, it's not just one, it's let's say hundreds or thousands of votes that come in. Then the server, if he receives a vote and then mutates, permutates the, the votes it receives, it receives. I don't know anymore in the second step to whom he sent the, the first vote it received in the red envelope. Because if I have many, I, I get like uh, bunches of votes. It, it cannot be even if I look at the network, I will have a lot of arrows going here, red, yellow, green. You will not be able anymore, depending how many servers you use, to actually see, okay, red went uh, at the end to, to this uh, ballot. And here I make sure yeah, also to to hide the, the the IP address more or less of, of the user itself because uh, there are a lot of messages going through the system, not just votes. You don't know if somebody who used the system right now, the blockchain system, this mixed net server, was actually uh, casting a vote and if they did uh, when when it was actually received at the at the ballot box. 
and uh, to make sure that the servers, this is why I also talked about zero knowledge proofs before, to make sure that the server, when they when they receive the vote, let's say the first one receives the red envelope, decrypts it, it should show to the network on the blockchain that it decrypted the, the envelope right, so that it didn't change the vote somehow, that when it mixed the votes together, the batches of vote that, uh, that it received, that it didn't put anything extra into it, that uh, it, it leave, left everything as it is. It should, it should just show that it mixed everything correctly and it decrypted everything correctly. And here we can use zero knowledge proofs. We don't have to show how we mixed and how we decrypted, but we can still show that we did it right. And every server, when it receives like a batch of votes, it always generates a zero proof, uh, which they can put on uh, on the on the blockchain. Okay, here I talked about revoting, also short, uh, because I don't think I have so much time anymore. We use hash change, uh, hash chains to actually make sure that the voter, when it has an initial vote, let's say it's zero, uh, and it hashes the the next random value for which it has for which it has um, a valid signature from the central authority. Because it's the only one that knows the random number, and we said the hash function is collision free and nobody can guess it. So whenever I send to the blockchain my real random number here in the left sense is R1, I can show ah, I was the one that actually cast the first ballot. And then I can again send another hash, hash R2. And when I want to change my second ballot, the same thing, I can send R2 the next time. And if you look for it for the blue arrows here, if I go through such a chain with the ballots, I just say, okay, the last ballot in our sense is ballot B will be the right ballot. On the left side, you see how, how you can do it uh, if you want infinity time of votes. Uh, on the uh, right side, you can see if you want to limit it to, let's say, B uh, vote changes. You can create a hash chain directly with HBSDN, and the um, voter always uh, sends the last one. So when the voter generates a random number, it hashes it B times, and it keeps all the hashes in between. And whenever it, uh, the voter wants to, to recast the vote, it can resend the next one in its list. And uh, as I said, because the hash is secure, uh, the voter will be the only one that, that knows this random number, so it will be the only one who can who is able to actually change the ballot. Okay, here again, uh, I, I told you all the parts. You see it in, in more general, how everything goes through from Alice, Bob, and Eve that cast the vote. It goes through the mixed service, the anonymity network, and at the end to the tailing authority, so the, to the public readable database, the blockchain. And uh, when the deadline passes, the tailing authority can then uh, just add the votes together and can show everybody by decrypting uh, the ballots that everything was transparent and correct. And the central authority here, uh, I also showed you, is the one that checks the ID card at the beginning, the passwords, and makes sure that, uh, that the voter can just vote uh, one once initially. But then afterwards, of course, with our system can change the initial vote, but cannot cast a new initial vote. Only if you have the the blind signature for one initial vote, you can then only uh, change from the initial vote the next votes, but you cannot you cannot generate a new initial vote. Every voter is just one initial vote. Okay, uh, I talked about the central authority is the one that uh, is uh, doing the blind signatures, giving out the tokens. It should be accessible all the time. This is why I also talked about this is the bottleneck here. It would be good to have many servers to have multi-party computation here, and it's needed to, to check the, the ID cards. You have the anonymity network, which is the one that is also connected more or less to the blockchain. It can be a smart contract system that uh, receives encrypted envelopes, decrypts them, and goes through the mixed network and puts the zero knowledge proofs that it decrypted and mixed the votes correctly on the on the blockchain. Uh, and here you can have a system uh, with uh, with time slots that it waits for let's say 1,000 votes to come in and then it starts the uh, the, the the mixing and and uh, going forth. So for somebody that just looks at the network, they will not understand anymore because there are too many possibilities from where the vote came. You have the voting application, which should be easable to use. We didn't write it yet, so we have just terminal. But in, when we when we get to it, should be like a nice user interface on the mobile phone, which shows you like uh, green check marks if you did something correctly, if your vote arrived. So the voter shouldn't see everything I told you now. All these complex algorithms. It should be easy to understand, to use, uh, 
And uh, this is also a part, this is very important actually, because it's also in German law, it, it should be, the, the voter shouldn't be stressed by the, the underlying, uh, underlying algorithms, it should be easy to use for everybody that wants to vote. Yeah, here because I said everything, I don't want to go through it again. I, I showed you in this picture actually how the overall uh, thing works. So they start from the voters, they go to the central authority. The central authority gives out the blind signatures, this token. With this token, you can use the anony anonymity network, the mixed servers. Then it gets mixed through. At the end, it will be saved in the blockchain. And after the deadline has passed, uh, the tailing authority can actually decrypt everything. Uh, Mabuba also showed you this picture nicer than mine, that we have like five servers. We also did tests on, on uh, this thing, but uh, I told you from the beginning, it's it's very at the beginning. Uh, we also worked on other stuff now, but I want to come back to it because I find the topic very interesting. We can use actually also our black ch blockchain to do to do this uh, test for, for e-voting. Okay, then thank you very much. I hope I didn't talk too fast because I wanted to get through as fast as possible. Please, if you have any questions uh, now or whenever you see my email address here, daniel.peters at ptp.de, please write me if you're also interested to add some servers to our network. We're very happy uh, to add you. We want to uh, grow our network anyways. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Peters, for your presentation. And now we continue with the questions. Uh, we don't have much, um, a lot of time, uh, but at least one question. Uh, let me see if the, there is a, one question in the chat. Yes, uh, Solar SP. Yes, I have a question. Hi, your talk was pretty inter interesting. Thank you for your time. Is there a quantum computing algorithm for a voting that is already on the works? or is fully implemented? So we're not looking into quantum computing resistant algorithms yet, but normally the ones that you use like AAS, they are more or less because they don't depend on, um, if you use like, let's say with elliptic course, they don't depend on, on discrete logarithms where you can actually, um, because with quantum uh, computers, you could easily find uh, the the prime numbers when you refactor it and these other algorithms we're using we don't really look at it but there are algorithms already now that are resistant to that so they are not actually using prime refactoring to to get secure public and private keys but if you just rely on that you're right in the future it could be a problem when uh, quantum computers get uh, more available and uh, faster and are easier to, to store to keep in the quantum state, then yes, uh, we should rethink about our whole way we do business. <laughs> so if you do something on eBay, Amazon, everything, as I said, it, it depends on the thing that we have one way functions and quantum computers uh, have a possibility to easier guess like prime factoring and, and other things. And then we have to think about new algorithms that we think are one way functions. Yeah. But it's, it's, not, it's not our main. It's not our main research now. Okay, we have a, a last question. Uh, you showed the same uh, picture of uh, Mabubi. Is 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 possible to to after start uh, implementing a, a blockchain, you could add in new services or new uh, functionalities to it for e voting for smart meters. Yes, thank you for the question. Exactly, this is what my voice. It's the same uh, system Mabuba showed, where she did her uh, uh, smart meter test. We can then use uh, the blockchain for a lot of things. It's not just one thing, and you can always add servers. It's a permission blockchain, so you have to ask Mabuba, and she showed you in the picture till now. PTP is like more or less the main node with with the in metro nodes, and the other ones are more or less connected. If we make it bigger, you can give permissions to the nodes uh, what they do exactly. And then, of course, you can. Everybody that is connected to the network can implement their own smart contracts, and could be completely something different. So, parallel to the e-voting, you have, could have smart meters running, and uh, and other algorithms that are related to metrology. But we see it now, and we, I think, also in the future, we'll always see it as a research network. I don't think there will be any business running on this network. It's just for people and uh, NMIs that want to come in, that want to test something before it goes into into public, into their own country. 
So if they want to say, okay, we have something here, it's for research before we start developing our own blockchain and putting it out our own country, let's just test it here. Then we are the right partner for it, but we were not planning to make, make a business out of it. Okay, the last question, how this project changed the validation of the voting machine? The validation in the sense, uh, if uh, what we're doing actually, we're testing out what um, IT secure, uh, security mechanisms exist. And if someday, because we don't have it yet in Germany, a company comes by and says, I implemented that way, we want to have the knowledge to know how we can validate it. And this is why we actually do it. We try to implement all of these functions I told you to have a broad knowledge about everything. Afterwards, the manufacturer themselves should decide how they implement it. So they don't need to use our, our blockchain infrastructure. They can have their own solutions. But for us, it's important because we are the validators to understand what they're doing. And this is why we are proactively doing research in this domain. Okay. But we, didn't, we didn't validate anything. We had some voting machines in 1999. That didn't quite work. Since then, the German government said they won't, don't want to try it again. But I think in the future, of course, uh, future is coming, digitalization is coming. One day we will have it, some country have it, like Estonia, Finland have some voting. Also, I've, I mean directly on, on, the, on the smartphone. Also, in, in the States, you have for, for military services, smartphone, you have like, I think in Brazil, also voting machines, normal voting machines. So the things are there. In Germany, we're a little bit slow because we're still afraid, but we, uh, we have to look into it, yeah. Okay. Thanks again, Mr. Peters, for your presentation and for answering the questions. Of course, uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Now our speaker will be, uh, is Wilson Mello, and the talk is about blockchain for monitoring critical infrastructures, learning from data and measurement. Wilson is a researcher at the Brazilian Institute of Metrology, Quality and Technology in Metro and a lecturer at Metrology Postgraduation Program since 2019. He holds a PhD in Informatics from Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and his main expertise regards software for industrial applications, especially solutions related to measurement, control, pattern recognition, and cybersecurity. Welcome, Mr. Wilson. Thanks for your participation in this event, and you can go ahead with your presentation. Thank you so much, Rodolfo. I think you have my screen, all right? Yes. Yes, okay. So let's put in the presentation mode. People, thank you everyone for the invitation to be here with you today. It's, there is a, a very specific advantage in to be one of the last ones to speak because uh, my partners already talk a lot of concepts, interesting topics about blockchain. So I can use the, the topics and the concepts that we already described to you to explain my, the ideas we are looking for and to bring something more related to what we are have been doing in the last five years. Well, uh, I am from Metro. Uh, I work in the Laboratory of Metrology and Informatics, the acronym is LAINF, and our activities are too much related to cybersecurity when you apply it to the scope of metrology and especially measuring instruments. So there are several activities that you develop in LAINF, and blockchains is one of the research topics. And you have also a, a good team to work here in LAINF because we are a team of six uh, PhD researchers. And also you have uh, working with uh, several students, even from the graduated, graduated students, they also undergraduate. And uh, since 2019, you have a cooperation with the PTB and the University of Lisbon to develop some talks related to research in blockchain and its applications to the metrology. So uh, what we have done in the last five years, I'd say, is very interesting to notice that the, the topic uh, related to the blockchain and metrology together, that's why I am writing blockchain plus metrology, because I'm considering the two knowledge areas working together. And since 2018 so far, uh, we are working in different talks and made important contributions in several aspects. So uh, here I have just a, a, a brief description about a timeline in terms of our research achievements and mentioning the works that have been developed for other partners from people in the PTB, Dr. Peters, 
Dr. Moni, and there is an important step that feels so far. And we could ask what will be our next steps from here. Yes. And I would like to start with three ideas that I will develop in, 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 during this presentation. Because uh, in my point of view, we are in a moment that where we need uh, more practical projects. And what I, I want to say by that, because so far uh, we have a lot, made a lot of research in blockchains and metrology, usually in topics that are too much related to new ideas that are not so practical at the moment. So sometimes you have some ideas, oh, you can use blockchain to build a system like that. But uh, when you look after the idea, you see that there are a lot of things to do before you could propose a practical uh, application using blockchains. So sometimes you have the difficult in to propose ideas that are more practical, more effective for the moment that we are living now. The second aspect that I would call attention is that you need uh, to fill the gap between our metrologists and people. And when I say people, I am referring to people that uh, use uh, uh, measuring instruments, for instance, meters, manufacturers, or even users. Because in many times when they talk about, for instance, to the manufacturer, about to use blockchain in any practical projects, usually he look after me, uh, look at me and say, I will not do that because not practical to me is not, it not resulting any profit from my business. So I would like to uh, look after some more practical ideas than use blockchains in my uh, product or in my solution. And the third aspect that I would like to emphasize is the uh, maybe you are need more easy understanding examples to apply. So uh, I feel the same when I talk, for instance, about uh, blockchains for uh, public, uh, public key infrastructures for smart meters, because people many times are very far from this reality when they talk about that. So that's possible to bring some examples that people will be identified a little more because more uh, close to them in the day by day, or they can understand more easily? That is the question. And when I talk about these topics, I would like to, to talk a little about critical infrastructures. And when I talk critical infrastructures, or CIs, like you uh, could hear, uh, I talk about cyber physical uh, critical infrastructures because they are the ones, because they are the ones that need sensing. And since you talk about sensing, you are also talking about measurements. And wherever I have measurements, I also need metrology there. And besides, it's possible to consider that critical infrastructures, they are crucial to economy, business, people safety, environment conditions, even for the national sovereignty in the countries. So when I talk about that, we talk about reliable information. If I am monitoring a, a CI infrastructure, it's necessary to have reliable information. And of course, blockchains are a very interesting approach to provide that. So you can make several questions about how are we collecting information about our critical infrastructures? How are we storing all the information that you are collecting? And are we able to provide tools that can efficiently uh, audit this information and offered solutions against cyber attacks, including internal attacks or something like that attempted in sabotage. So this is the question that you can do about critical infrastructures. And I would like to introduce to you our case study here. That is a research and development project in a, a partnership between Inmetro and NESA. NESA means North Energia SI, it's a company in Brazil that is responsible for built and uh, uh, NASA built indeed, and now it operates Belo Monte hydroelectric power plant. You can see by this picture here, yes, Belo Monte is a very huge infrastructure that you have in the middle of our country, more specifically in the Amazon forest. And you can see by the picture, uh, you can have an idea about the huge uh, in, uh, uh, improvement that you have here. Uh, it means you have a power plant. Uh, it is able to generate uh, 
something around it, one million megawatts uh, in terms of energy, 11 million megawatts. There are more than 3 million cubic meters of concrete in all this infrastructure and the charge in water and the capacity of the reservoir is something around 62,000 uh, cubic meters per second. That is the, the charge capacity in the uh, power plant, in the electric power plant. So you can have the idea about the huge uh, impediment that you have here and about all the conditions that have involved in monitors uh, such infrastructure. So you have, first of all, a diverse of sensors. It includes PZT sensors, ultrasound sensors, several others. Uh, you also have uh, the possibility of sensing not only the structure health, I mean, the dam and the slopes, but also environmental monitoring because uh, Belo Monte needed to present its compliance with several environmental rules in Brazil. Besides, we also have uh, the possibility of monitoring this CI by using images and software sensors. Today, they estimate they have something around 3,000 points of measurements of points that they want to measure because the system is ongoing and not implemented so far. And all the system that needs to project here needs to collect, store information, and also enable data audit in terms of reliability and transparently. So what you can see here in all this, this uh, uh, entrepreneur né, in this project, because you have a, a amount of data to store, there is a lot of information that you need to do. Uh, we also need to have an automated process to make the data audit. And also it's important that this process must be readable and uh, must involve uh, uh, the process needed to be, to be readable for any organization that will be involved in this monitoring. So what is our proposal here? The project that you developed in the last two years because this project started in 2021. So the first uh, consideration that you need to make here is that you are talking about big data, which means that there's a lot of information. Uh, this big data is related to measurements because uh, every information that you are getting here is related to uh, some kind of measurement or sensing. And also we need to put that, or you want to put that inside the blockchains. But uh, for a start, you have the first problem related to blockchain that is that it's throughput. Blockchain is not scalable in terms of throughput. Uh, it means that blockchain will not have the same performance that you could have in a centralized system. Uh, so big data, is of course uh, a challenge when you consider any solution based on blockchain. So what solution we decide to adopt here? We, we opted by the use the off-chain method. That means I have two data sources or two data repositories to store uh, the information that I are gathering. Uh, the first one will be a NoSQL DB that is a centralized database, so it, it, can, it can be scaled and it also can uh, be a centralized solution to get high performance. And together with the solution, we also have our blockchain that works like a security mirror to start also partial information that's related with the core information that I put here. Of course, since I am uh, writing my data in two databases and in some aspects they are redundant, but of course we have much more data here than here in the blockchain, it will be necessary to have data recovery procedures that are able to compare this data and assure that the data that I have here in my NoSQL database is so uh, readable like the control information that I have in the blockchain. So in other words, what I'm doing here, I have a process that analyzes information, that store information in OSQL and puts in the blockchain uh, meta information, I would say, or maybe a, a resume of the main information that I can use to check, to verify my main repository here. So how it does? So let's see the blockchain implementation roadmap. That is our architecture and it's a cloud-based architecture. In our case, we are using the AWS uh, cloud solutions 
but you don't need to be restricted to the AWS. Indeed, any other solution, uh, cloud solution that uh, I could adopt could be useful here because usually they offer the same services, but usually with brand name, different brand names. So I have this architecture and I have different organizations that are taking part on it. So the first idea that I need to have here that I have a cloud-based permission at blockchain network. It means that you are uh, decided to use a solution where all the organizations here are identifiable organizations. And we adopted the Hyperledger Fabric blockchain platform inside the AWS services environment. Uh, besides, uh, we consider that most of our network services are already in the cloud, which means I can use different kinds of services that are have the automation here. I don't need to develop my own services. I just need to make use the ones that are already are available for me. And besides, uh, I have, like I said before, uh, no SQL database management that is able to uh, manage the data I am storing off chain. And of course, the block, this database assures that I can have the scalability to store uh, whenever data amount I need. And also I can have fast querying to this database because it's a, a, a performance oriented part of my solution. And Together with this architecture, we also have the independent organizations that they integrate the blockchain network and also they make part in, the, in a distributed consensus here, which means that the network reliability, the blockchain reliability, uh, we will rely on the fact that all the organizations, the involved in the organizations take part in some aspect in the consensus decision. Are not centralized the consensus like a private blockchain. I'm establishing a blockchain that is based in a consensus quorum uh, that decides what are the transactions that you compose the next block. And finally, since you are using the Hyperledger Fabric, the idea is that uh, each organization are able to provide a set of peers. And peers, I mean, they are usually virtual machines or containers. And the this peers will implement all the blockchain features. In case of Fabric, the role is related to endorsers, committers, and also the orders. Okay, and what you can say about the data recovery audit information? So uh, the off-chain approach implies, of course, that I needed to compare the information that I have in my NoSQL database with the information that I stored in the blockchain. And since in the blockchain, I have a, a very smaller set of information, I will have there something that you're calling here like a cryptographic digits. Usually, if you take any off-chain solution, any usually, uh, usual off-chain solution, they will say you that the, the uh, cryptographic digits will be the same that cryptographic hashes. However, we are also studying the possibility of using similarity hashes that could be interesting to get something like a, a brief set of the data. And so you can check the data in situations, for instance, like a partial data loss. And also we, we glimpse that you can use it here zero knowledge proof protocols, because it's possible to have a protocol where uh, entities assessing the data in the NoSQL database need to prove to the blockchain that they still have the original data there. So that could be a very interesting approach here. And you see that uh, a suitable solution to perform data checking is using smart contracts. In practice, if, when you consider that, uh, we have a valuable application for smart contracts since they are they will be very fine measurements based on, on cryptographic properties. And also you open the possibility that organizations, the organizations that compose blockchain, can also implement their own smart contracts to verify data in an independent auditing. So it would be a very interesting uh, result in such approach. And if you consider a deeper level in this study, we also will conceive that it is possible to use uh, autonomous blockchain oracles, maybe centralized or distributed, to implement this verification on checking data of Shen and uh, verify if the information that I have in blockchain 
are enough to attest this data authenticity and integrity. In terms of performance issues, you also have an interesting result here because Hyperledger Fabric has a theoretical uh, performance uh, expected in terms of two, uh, 2,000 uh, TPS transactions per second. Uh, but when we are going to uh, this result, the, these two 2,000 transactions per second, they are only presenting practical scenarios. And the practical scenarios are very difficult to simulate when they are, we are making studies about the performance. So uh, we had a very interesting result when we started to use the AWS Lambda that are closed services, they are independent services and more close to the architecture that you usually uh, know like microservices. And you are able to get a uh, performance around 1.2, uh, 1, 1, 1,200 uh, transactions per second. That is significantly higher than the a result that you have in simulations using, for instance, Hyperledger Caliper, that is usually a tool uh, very used to measure the performance in Hyperledger Fabric, or also any test using multi-thread clients that you had done in prior works. And of course, the size block in the blockchain also have a significant impact on performance, which means uh, we can optimize the off-chain verification by aggregating data in packaging, low packages, and reducing so the number of transactions that you're trying to put in the blockchain. So in a resume, what you could say that you, uh, you learn from so far and that you still want to learn uh, in the future. So first of all, we see that monitoring critical infrastructures is a very fascinating uh, problem and it is usually easy to understand every time when you try to explain what it means to monitor a hydroelectric power plant, people usually understand what we're talking about. And it's a very challenging problem if you consider the aspects related to using blockchain and also metrology solutions. Uh, besides, you have that blockchain critical infrastructures, blockchain-based critical infrastructures, it could enable a very interesting aspect that possibilitates the data monetization, it seems something very attractive when you talk about companies that need to implement these blockchains. So it's a topic that's not related to metrology, but it also could be something like an incentive when you consider to incentivize uh, people that develop the solutions to adopt blockchains like a possible approach. Uh, finally, I would say that we have a specific measurement data amounts that generate a big data problem. And of course, when you talk about big data and blockchains, you need to consider new ideas about how you are going to avoid the performance issues that blockchains face. And finally, I would say that the data recovery is also a research topic by itself because it involves the possibility of using interesting cryptographic mechanisms or systems, and also the possibility of to explore to the part of chain oracles that is not only a search for uh, a topic for research, but also could generate new business models for meter manufacturers. Finally, I would like to say thank you to the North Energy SCA that it was or was the funding, it was funding this project for us. Here I have the names of our team that developed this project. And also I will let with you a link for our publications related to this project. If you have interest, you can check later. Thank you very much. And now Rodolfo, I return to you the work. We can't hear Rodolfo. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mello, for the interesting presentation. Now we continue. Uh, the, the time is strict and we don't have, uh, we have time only for one question. If someone want, would like to make a question, could put on the on the chat. Otherwise, um, uh, you could also send the direct report email for Wilson email. 
Yes, and my as that is here. Any question? People can text me, no problem. Okay. Thanks again, Mr. Wilson, for your presentation. And now uh, I have to go to uh, Francisco. No, Francisco. excuse me, I made a mistake. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, finally, I would like to introduce Alexis Valky, who will present in the, the, the 10th edition of Digital Transformation Magazine, The Acuerdo, Science at Measure. Dr. Valky has a Peruvian Germany, German consultant on quality infrastructure, development policy, agri agricultural development, and trade. From 2000 to 2016, he worked at for PTB in Braunschweig, Germany, as a project coordinator for quality infrastructure projects in Latin America and the Caribbean, and senior advisor in division uh, in the division globalization, trade and investment at the Federal Ministry of Co Economy and Co Cooperation and Development, and head the technical operation in Latin America and the Caribbean. Since 2017, he has been working as consultant based in Lima, Peru. And since 2013, he has been the editor of the annual magazine De Acuerdo, La Ciencia a Tu Medida. Uh, now, Mr. Falke, you could talk. Thank you, Rodolfo. Uh, you can see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can. Very good. So uh, we are at the end of, of this uh, uh, large uh, round of presentations. So I will try to make a very short presentation. Uh, <clears throat> as Rodolfo said, um, we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of this meteorology uh, magazine uh, with the launching of the, um, of the 10th issue. And um, we have in this magazine, we are dealing with different topics like water, soccer, energy, music, transport, change of the of the of the um, uh, of the um, uh, measurement units, or the definition of the measurement units, uh, food and and health. And why I, why I'm presenting it here, and why I'm uh, using the opportunity also to celebrate with you the the tenth anniversary is because the the tenth issue is about digital transformation. Um, I, I will uh, describe nearer the, this tenth uh, issue about digital transformation, uh, but uh, and, and which is available at www.revistadacuerdo.org. And um, well, we have ten issues in Spanish and uh, one issue in 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 English. Uh, about uh, water, and um, <clears throat> I will explain shortly uh, how this um, magazine was uh, created. And um, so um, we have the feeling that, uh, and probably you also experience in your own work that um, so the science of metrology is not really known in in in, in by 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 a lot of people. So in 2012. Uh, we decided to create a magazine that is um, uh, directed to to the youth, <clears throat> and uh, a magazine to create uh, curiosity on science and on metrology. <clears throat> so um, to embed the metrology aspect in in in, a, in uh, yeah, uh, daily daily uh, topics. Uh, with a language, a colloquial language, um, with uh, yeah, easy explanation of the scientific uh, uh, matters, but um, but assuring its uh, veracity. And so we produce every year uh, an issue in, in Spanish, and as I said, as I said, one one issue was uh, translated in into English. It's. Uh, um, with no cost distributed, and you have it as an online or as a printed version if, if the NMI decide to print it in, in their country. <clears throat> so, um, 
So uh, 11 NMIs from from the same region, uh, 10 NMIs from the same region are participating, and PTB is also participating. Uh, and uh, the same is the responsible editor. We have a editorial committee with members from from all the NMIs, uh, participating NMIs, and executive committee, and then the scientific journalists and authors. Um, so, and when we and each year we we decide which topic we we will um, we will yeah thematize for for the next issue, and um, so we found very interesting to make a, a an issue on metrology and digital transformation. Um, so we are uh, more and more connected in and using um, 4.0 technologies and also in metrology. Um, <clears throat> and so the, the main questions we have is how, how, how metrology is benefiting from the digital transformation and from the technologies. And on the one side, on the other side, how um, um, or what does the uh, digital transformation need from metrology? And then this um, linking question: uh, the, how how the digital transformation and metrology will evolve inter, inter, interdependent um, because they are uh, linked very close to each other. And so, for the for the magazine, um, the main questions were how how you apply these technologies and how the digital uh, devices functions in in health. In uh, enterprises, in um, education, and in the NMIs, and also for, for for the use. Also interesting, what are the consequences and opportunities for 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 the future work and for the for the study, and how the human factor is is dealing with that, and how you maintain the human factor in such kind of developments, and so. In the magazine, we treat these questions and, and actually more than that. This is the, the magazine. We have um, uh, different articles, for example, an article uh, written by in Argentina by INTI um, about Industry 4.0 and the, and the fourth revolution molds the work environment, how it work, molds the work environment. And, we don't know, we have only not only so the the how do you say the, the story behind that we we try also to use uh, graphics and, and visual elements so this is the article in four pages um, so to be more attractive and then uh, this article is developed in in Panama by Senamep and IP so the artificial vision as expert assistance and disseminating the official time in the digital era uh, developed by Bolivia, IPmetro, um, a day without internet and what happens also to, to the metrology uh, work uh, written by Peru in Acal as a fix, fictionary situation. Then, um, will technology free us from all ills? A uh, question put by Mexico Senam <clears throat> and Colombia, ENM Colum of Colombia, uh, about the, 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 the monitoring uh, and, and through that, uh, the lack of an alibi um, because everything is, is, uh, is registered. So I know at what time you were not synchronized in your classes. Um, from Uruguay Latu to calibrate in a click. And uh, the question, do machines learn? Um, produced by Argentina Inti. And uh, the cloud for everybody, the Scrum cloud for everybody, uh, produced by Peru in a column. How does the GPS work? Um, developed by Inti Argentina. Yeah, software helps in the calibration of measurement tape. Uh, so, also by Colombia ENM. 
um, signing times of hash. So we hear here also today something about hash. Uh, uh, there was no one article about uh, blockchain technology, lamentably, but at least hash uh, for, uh, developed by El Salvador Sim and um, and history how how the um, digital management process management reduces time and so um, the service can be provided by the shortest way an article produced uh, produced by Paraguay in it so these are the articles in in the in this new issue we launched it uh, on Tuesday and um, yeah I invite you to visit our our web page www www.revistadacuerdo.org and hopefully you enjoy the lecture and share it also with interested persons. Thank you very much, Rodolfo, for having this opportunity. Thanks, Mr. Valky, for the presentation. Uh, if there is some uh, question, uh, we could, uh, the persons could put on the chat, the presenters could put on the chat, otherwise, uh, there is no question. Let me see. Thanks again, Mr. Fauci. Uh, it's hard because uh, in the 20th century, it's sufficient to calibrate equipment, calibrate the standards, calibrate the, the metro metrology. It's not easy, but uh, we are we calibrate the standards, the equipment, the uh, uh, and the, the work finished there. Nowadays, we have to to cope with the 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 clouds, the the cybersecurity, the now with the artificial intelligence and the the, the pace that this this happens is very quick. We and we have to to go forward, go to to keep it. Uh, don't let a, a, a long uh, be far back uh, to these technologies. Uh, this technology is evolving very, very quick, and it's hard for the metrologists to to keep in uh, uh, in in day with uh, all all the things that is happened. Yes. A, okay. And and. Um, the same for as a director of, of the magazine. I don't know in in two years or one year or two years. So if you want to read a, an article, you you ask Chat GPT to do that for you, and then you don't need our magazine anymore. I don't know. We will see. <laughs> yes, we are going to see. Uh, it, it, it's the change is very quick. Uh, probably it's very hard to anyone. The metrologist is is part of this, but it's hard to anyone to keep uh, uh, with the, the 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 evolution of the technology. As I said at the beginning of the day, a brief survey will appear in the chat. I invite you to answer the questions. Okay, while the survey is being completed, 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 I would like let me see if this is in the chat. Okay, it is now on the chat. I I, I would like to uh, why I would like to take this opportunity to invite you all to visit our website where you will find more information as well as preview presentation of pre previews of presentation and records of the past event. Thanks to all, especially to Mr. Jean Martina, Ms. Mabuba Moni, Mr. Daniel Peters, Mr. Wilson Mello, and Mr. Alex Valky for their presentations and for sharing the, their knowledge of these interesting topics. Finally, I invite everyone to turn on their cameras so we can take a screenshot. Thank you very much for turning on your uh, cameras. Um, and I want to take advantage of this moment in order to ask you 
to answer the survey, the evaluation survey, I have uh, write down the link in order to evaluate this event. This information is really important for us in order to improve this kind of events. Then uh, please take a, a moment in order to, un to fill out this survey, please. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I see that we are more than 50 people in these sessions. Then uh, some of you are, are missing to turn on your camera, please. Uh, I, I can wait just a moment in order to add more people in order to see everyone here or, or more people at least. Um, please uh, don't be shy, <laughs> turn on your cameras. And I'm going to take the photo in, in a moment. There's just a little more moment. Uh, mm -mm. <laughs> OK. Uh, just a little more. <laughs> OK, Carlos is making a change in order to see as a big uh, auditorium. Yes, I'm going to take the photo. Uh, please smile. I'm going to count to three. <laughs> One, <laughs> two, three. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good day. And please don't forget, forget. to fill out the, the survey. Thank you very much. Rodolfo, the floor is yours. Thank you for participation. See you on uh, the next M40 T day. Probably in two, in two months. Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon. The people from uh, Mexico, or, or good, good lunch. Bye, have a good day, and thank you thank very you. much for your participation. Bye, thank nice you. to meet you. <laughs>